this morning to help me with the chalice lighting. I'd like to invite some people up. I'd like to invite the Lowry family. And Zach Keating. Leslie Mayfield. And Lowell Steinbrenner. Across the generations, we have carried the flame. We fought the injustice, sang the songs, spoke for truth, and built something lasting. We join in the line and we carry forward the flame forward. Across the generations, we are tending the flame, hand in hand together, we share in the work of fighting injustice, singing the songs, and speaking the truth. And we are here to build something lasting. We join in the line and carry the flame forward. Across the generations, we are nourished by the flame. We sing new songs, break old barriers, and, and join in the work. As we find space in what has come before, we make space for those who come after. We join in the line and carry on the flame. Across the generations, this flame comes to us. We are here for the songs, for the justice, for the community, sharing the work. We are here now, too, to build something new and lasting. We are ready for a new day together. We join in the line and we carry the flame forward. Thank you. that Helen was here to sing that for us. This poem by Charles Simic is called Explorers. 
They arrive inside the object at evening. There is no one to meet them. The lamps that they carry cast their shadows back into themselves. They make notations. The sky and the earth are of the same impenetrable color. There is no wind. If there are rivers, they must be under the ground. Of the marvels we sought, no trace. Of the strange new stars, nothing. There's not even dust, and so we must conclude that someone passed recently with a broom. As they write, the tiny universe stitches its black thread into them. Eventually, nothing is left except a faint voice, which might belong either to one of them or to someone who came before. It says, I'm grateful that you finally come. It was starting to get lonely. I recognize you. You are all that has eluded me. May this be our country. Dear members and friends and loved ones and invited guests of UUFWC, for every congregation I have served, there's been a moment in time when I felt a clear sense that that's where I was supposed to be, serving those people in the place where we dwelt and ministering to their higher purpose. I felt a sense of the rightness of those relationships. Often I felt that it was to bring multiple generations together so, and help them nurture each other and learn from each other. Sometimes it was for a certain memorial service or when I was in Arkansas to publicly officiate gay weddings that were legal. With the UU congregation in Fort Wayne, Indiana, it was to help them maintain and preserve a building that is uniquely striking visually. It is a double hyperbolic paraboloid. I had to learn to say that. <laughs> Sometimes it was to assist members and neighbors in need as it was with the 100-year flood in Columbia, South Carolina. But never before. Never before I came here to serve as your interim in the summer of 2019, never before had I served a congregation whose commitment is so deep and whose standards are so high when it comes to our relationship with the land and the earth and natural resources. In fact, I served some congregations, especially going back some years, who looked into doing their renovation project with environmentally friendly and sustainable resources. They saw that that would be more expensive and they lowered their standards. You have never lowered your standards. Those high standards bring to mind for me a cherished mentor of mine whose name was Dave Rickard. When I went to be the interim minister for the Unitarian Church in South Bend, Indiana in 2008, their central issue was that their building had outlived its useful purpose. You all know how that feels. So the consultant from the UUA who they had engaged to help them with their building project and its capital campaign was Dave Rickard. And since I was a new-ish minister, I doubted whether I would have much to contribute to those conversations. But Dave saw a potential in me that a lot of other people had never seen. He saw more in me than I saw in myself. Dave Rickard was a member of the UU Church in Little Rock, Arkansas, where I would serve as interim minister several years later. And he was nationally known for his work to abolish the death penalty. I helped the South Bend Church clarify their vision for their new building, and I learned a lot. And over the years, I continued to learn from so many people about building projects and capital campaigns, and I enjoyed each one more than the last. But your building project, this breathtaking expansion project here, never before have I been part of something so ambitious. And ambitious doesn't have to be a bad word. Ambitious can be a very good word. I looked up ambitious in the dictionary, and one definition of it is a plan or project that is intended to satisfy high aspirations, and therefore it is difficult to achieve, as in an ambitious enterprise. 
being part of the expansion of this building is a pinnacle of my career. The moment that I knew that serving as your interim minister here in Wayne County was exactly where I was supposed to be and what I was supposed to do came very shortly after I arrived. I was sitting in what was then the youth room talking with Bert Bishop and Bert began telling me that back in the summer of 2003, a consultant from the UUA had helped your con congregation envision and plan for the building that you have just expanded. He was top notch, Bert said. Don't remember his name, but he was from Arkansas. He was a bit of a name dropper because he told us that he knew Bill Clinton, but he was a great consultant and he helped us a lot. Well, I almost fell off my chair in surprise and I said to Bert, he did know Bill Clinton. His name was Dave Rickard, and he was a cherished mentor of mine. He was from Little Rock, and he died shortly before I went to be their interim there in May of 2013. All of you have some people in your hearts in whose memory you saw this expansion project to completion, even though they are not able to be physically with us today. Since Dave Rickard was not here to help you with this phase of expanding your sweet building, I was here to help and support you in memory of him. I believe that today all of those people you are holding in your hearts are proud, and I believe Dave Rickard is proud. The Congregational Historian Margaret Bendroth, in her essay, The Spiritual Practice of Remembering, writes about all those people we are holding in our hearts and also about the generations who will come after us. She calls them the invisible people. She writes, we live within a web of holy obligations. We are connected to people of the world today and to those who created the world with their own labor. We are also connected to other invisible people, the unknown number of generations yet to be born. And she says, one of the most important things we can do in the way we care for the earth and in the way we care for our local church life is to recognize those invisible people and their mystical, aggravating, inspiring, puzzling, and deeply important continuing presence. That's an inclusive mission. I would say it's a universalist vision. It is a mission that has within it elements of empathy and forgiveness and grace. When I look at your at long last completed project to expand your building, I could not ask for more. You have made Unitarian Universalism available and accessible to so many more people. But now that it is complete, there is one more thing I would ask of you. Continue to hold high your original, high aspirations and high standards as Dave Rickard had an ambitious vision for me and my ministry, I continue to hold out an ambitious, ambitious vision for you and your ministry so that our ever-expanding web of holy obligations may sparkle with the dew of a new and brighter day. You all just look beautiful. <laughs> Even with your little burglar masks on, you <laughs> just look beautiful. And this place looks beautiful. What you have done in the midst of a pandemic and a world falling apart and truth indistinguishable from lies, what you have done is just amazing. So Rachel Naomi Remen, who writes wonderful books and is a wonderful doctor, had a grandfather who was an Hasidic Rebbe. When she was four years old, he brought her a gift. Think of a four-year-old girl, what might they want? He brought her a pot full of dirt. I can tell you're all as excited as she was. She said, I had no trouble telling my granddad that this was no present that I would want. 
And he said, little dear, just take this teapot and put water in it once a week and see what might happen. She said, my little four-year self, I lasted for two weeks and I could do it every day, just like Grandpa said. And he would come visit and he would say, are you doing that? Are you watering it? And she would say, yes, Grandpa, I'm doing it. About the third week, she had about had it with this clump of dirt just sitting there. But she kept going because this was a beloved grandpa. And the fourth week, there was a little green leaf that came up. And she was so excited, she knew her grandpa. I'd never seen anything like this before. And so she took it right to show him, look! In 1972, there was a group that started that said there's a need in Wayne County for a group of religious liberals, for a group that asked hard questions, for a group that delved into the meaning of life literally, and that group started to meet. And that group met for a long time in borrowed space and it sustained itself. And it continued and it continued. And in 1996, that group bought a building on Sable. And I want to tell you, that group took that little building, used every nick and cranny, recreating everything possible to try to figure out how to make this space work. And you all know that because you're the ones that did it. And then it wasn't big enough. And you're not a people who ever said, we want to grow because we want, to, we want more money or we want bigger projects. We want to be able to say we have a bigger church. You never said any of those things. What you said is, we want a louder voice in Wayne County. We want to be able to invite more people that belong here. We know there are more people that can sense this mission, and that's why we want to grow. And you did the unthinkable you bought this piece of property and you built on it that green building that took more money and you built on it because you followed a dream. You took the little teapot and you took that little piece of dirt and you just kept pouring water on it. And then it wasn't big enough because you knew there was a message that needed to get into more ears and more minds, that you had a mission that went even farther than that, that went into Medina County and went into Holmes County and went into Ashland County and even went into parts of Stark County. You knew that and you held on to that. And so you said, we need more chairs, we need more space. We need the humanists and the coming of age group and the youth all to get to meet together at the same time. Isn't that an odd thing? We want to be multi-generational. But then you built this building with your courage and your faith and your stamina and your hands and your money and your belief, you built this building in the midst of a world that was falling apart, in the midst of a time when so many people gave up behind your masks and at social distances, when it felt like revolution was happening all around us, you hung on. Meg Wheatley, social organizer, says we don't have hope because we say to one another, it'll all be fine. It'll all just be fine. That there's more depth to it than that. That what it takes is getting up every morning and reconfirming to what your principles are. What has your name on it? Being open and aware to what is calling you to do. I'm getting into your part, I'm sorry. <laughs> Take that out. <laughs> you have created a space that is the ground of that chalice. It is the bowl. 
you have created a space that says new and different people will come in and we will be willing to flex with those new and different people. You have created a space, and it's Kathy Chiney that brought it all to us from the State Board of Education. Some of us never thought we would get anything good from the State Board of Education. <laughs> and it was Simon Sinek asking why. Why do we pay an electric bill? Why do we build a building? Why do we have these things? It's because of that commitment to truth is important to diversity is important, to binary isn't big enough and more important and what I want to emphasize today is now that you have the work done, not really. It's always tempting to think, okay, now it's perfect. Or it isn't quite perfect, so I give up. And the point is, the perfect isn't good enough. That when we come together, we need to come together as a group of people who listen deeply, who look with soft eyes, who are open to who walks through the front door, who are open to changing when the people that walk through the front door, within the context of our covenant, that's important, but to welcome the new folks that come in the front door or those of us who have been here for 50 years and we're changing. In a world that needs complexity, perfect isn't good enough. Questions are good enough. Relying on one another's strength is good enough. Recognizing the skills and the talents in one another is good enough. And on the hardest days, gathering to call one another to our best selves again is good enough. Walter, before I quit, I want to tell you one more thing. Jenny already knows this. When they look like they're listening to you, they're watching the hawk land on the tree. <laughs> I've been preaching in front of windows for years. I know that. Um, perfect isn't good enough. But good enough is perfect. Good enough is perfect. So I had all of these words here, and now I'm going to call an audible because I'm going to change everything. Because I love this image of the dirt. I love this image of having something that so many of us think of as nothing and just putting some effort into it, just putting some work into it, just putting some consistency, some tenacity, some love into it, and making something happen. And this has been the story in this congregation for you. I feel like I shouldn't cross into this space. You were all over here. I feel like I should stay over here. <laughs> um, and this has been the story of this congregation for years, right? This tenacity, this always going a little bit more, always going a little bit bigger. How can we utilize the space? How can we do more than just the basics for economic sustainability? How can we be a champion of that? How can we do more? How can we feed and grow that plant? I'm curious to know what the plant was in this metaphor. Because here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking of this little girl who grows this plant, and maybe it's a flower, maybe it's a simple bean sprout, but she falls in love with the idea of that cultivation. And what do you do when you start to love that idea of gardening? Who are my gardeners? First of all, y'all are weird, I don't get you. <laughs> but I love you. And when you start gardening, once you start figuring out that magic, what do you do? More plants, mm. right? My wife got this bug, oh my God. The front yard in Richmond, the only place that got sun was just filled with topsoil bags and plants and stakes and all this. Who needs a lawn? We've got topsoil and tomato plants and we got one zucchini out of it. 
But what happens is you, that need to grow, that need to cultivate, that need to nurture keeps going. That's what you've done. You keep gardening. Now, my vegetable gardeners, my vegetable gardeners out there who, who are the ones who have to put the zucchini by the side of the road because you have too many? Who are you? Right? Who are the ones who are saying, who have I yet to foist tomatoes upon? <laughs> right? That's why we garden. One of the things we do when we garden is we sustain others. We love the act of creation. We love the act of cultivation. But it bears fruit, literally. We don't come together, we don't solely come together because we need each other. We come together because we need the faith. I, I know, some of you are probably going, wait, he's going to talk about faith? I thought this was a UU church. We need the faith. One of the things I want to remind us all in our faith, so many people think that when you're in UU, you can believe anything you want. We don't have a dogma. How many of you wish when things got tough, we had a dogma? How many of you ever once in a while would just be like, I wish I could just say, God, take care of it, and I don't have to think about it. But we know that sometimes things are deeper than that. Our faith calls us to go deep. When we don't have one thing to pin the problems on, that means we're responsible. That means we're the ones who have to make this world a better place. And this is where I want you to come and get your tomatoes when you need fed. I want you to dig in the garden we have planted and cultivated together and get fed again when you feel weak when you feel you have given all you can and you cannot sustain yourself, this community is to feed you. And then I want you to take some of those tomatoes and some of those cucumbers and that funny looking zucchini and I want you to take them out to your neighbors and friends. Because this world needs our fruit. I'm wearing blue and yellow right now very specifically because this world needs our fruit. Jay Clem stands at the corner four or five times a week holding a Black Lives Matter sign because this world needs our fruit. Even Ruthie, who makes our grounds look so beautiful, literally cultivates our soil around us to show us how important it is she gives. So many of you, right? How many of you were here for the service at the 1015 where we had all the thank yous, right? I'm assuming most of you were. So many people to thank. So many gardeners. So many people. And that's what I want us to remember about this building. This isn't just a greenhouse. This isn't a place where we just grow fruit for ourselves. This is the place where we start, where we cultivate, where we nourish ourselves, and we take it outside. Our job is to make this world a better place. This is where we feed our faith. This is where we make it happen. You are the ancestors. You are the invisible people. We talked about the invisible people, the people who are going to make this world a better place, the people who we do this work for. You are some of those invisible people. You will be the mentors one day. You will be the people that we, others refer to as the champions who made me who I am. That's you. That's what this space is for. I am so excited that we have a bigger, beautiful, newer building to do this in. But I am so much more excited for each and every one of you who will inhabit it. Those who are here now, those who have been here before, and those who are yet to come. Let's get our hands dirty, friends. Let us dig deep and make this world a beautiful place. And let us dedicate our new building. Do not roll off the stand. I'm 
watching you. On our wonderful screens on either side, you will see text. I will read aloud the white text. I will ask you to repeat the text that is yellow and in italics. And for those of you who are still wondering about what those squiggles mean as writing, it's simple and it's repeatable. We dedicate this building in ourselves. For the ancestors who have walked on this land generations before, who used the canopies of the trees as their hallowed halls. For those who initially gathered to find a place to grow their spirit, to enrich their lives and share their experiences. For those we have yet to welcome, who will change us as much, if not more, than we will change them. For the mission of love, growth, and compassion that we carry into the world, for the ministries of justice and mercy, and for the goals of community and peace. May these walls be strengthened by our love, but may they never constrain our mission. Reverend Walter asked me to say the words before the offering, which is funny because I always forget the offering. Offering is more than a price of an admission. Offering is our indication with what resources we do have that we belong here and that this place belongs to us, that this community belongs to us. It's, it's rather part of our covenant it's rather like saying, this is where I am. This is where I will be. You have been so generous as those of you who were at the information session between the services know. And I know you will continue to be generous because it is who you are. Because the commitment to this place and to this mission is so strong.
Thank you, Joe. And can we just get a thank you for Joe and for Helen for our special music and the folk orchestra who's left, but still. And thank you, Jenny, for the chalice lighting and for all of those who were up lighting our chalice at the beginning of our service. And, you know, they don't get a whole lot of respect, but we're going to have to start thanking our tech team who are streaming us and making us heard. Are you ready, folks? I mean, think about it. You got to be here on Sundays now. No more service in your pajamas. No more getting a cup of coffee in the middle of the sermon. Again, well, no, you can still do that. What do I care? We're going to be together. And we are going to be in the midst of change. I, the, the UUs, we love to talk about liminal space, the space between one goal and another, the space between spaces. And what we need to remember is we're always there. We'll be here for six months and we'll still be changing. We're going to have people walk through that door who are going to change us. We're going to have things that happen that we still need to get used to. And I can't think of a better group of people who are ready to change the world and themselves than everybody who's in this building right now. You have done wonderful work, and I cannot wait to see how you change the world. Blessed be, friends. May it be so. Before our prelude or postlude, you're all going to want to talk to Elaine if you haven't already after service, I'm assuming. Yes? No? She doesn't want to talk to you. <laughs> I would encourage you, if you haven't seen the build, if you've already seen the building after service, to go outside and to chat just to keep down the amount of particulates we're all breathing together, and it's a beautiful day for it. So thank you again for being here this morning.